This is Rick Falkfinger. He is the he's from Private Internet Access, and he's the founder of the Private Par Pirate Party, and he's going to talk about rallying people around big goals. We're really happy to have him here. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, Bernard. Are you awake? Yay! Awesome. Better? Is this better? Okay. So, hi everybody, I'm Rick Falkvinge, that's F-A-L-K-V-I-N-G-E on Twitter. Please feel free, free to quote me. I love seeing my name on print when I say something brilliant or when I say something stupid. I still get to see my name. I like that. So, I'm a head of privacy at Private Internet Access. I am, um, uh, my name is perhaps most known for, as Liz said, that I founded this Swedish and original Pirate Party, not the one here in Berlin. That went kind of morbid, I'm afraid. But the, the Pirate Party spread to about 70 countries, and so I have a bit of experience with this, how you build a large-scale movement. We tend to be libertarian, we tend to be individualists, so when the traditional structures tend to embrace, try to embrace us into one of these we're going to change the world things, all of us tend to go, you don't get to tell me what to do. No, you're not putting labels on me. But if we do this together, I'm not doing what you say. I'm doing my own thing. Thank you. Like, we, we are, this herding cats thing is really, really hard to incorporate into the old structures. Voting, associations, bookkeeping, registering an association. It's a nightmare, and I hate it. So I designed the Pirate Party to completely circumvent that. And it worked pretty well. It worked so well that we beat all of those established structures on less than 1% of their budget. Just by allowing people to go their own way instead of being told what to do. And here's that secret recipe. But first, a little bit about my background, how I came into privacy. Uh, Snowden tweeted something 36 hours ago about the Iranian revolution going on right now, or the Iranian protests. He tweeted that if you think surveillance was about privacy, you got it wrong. It was always about power. And I think this is the proper way to see privacy. It is not about an individual luxury. It is not even about an individual right. It is about decentralizing power at the very foundation of society. You cannot have democracy without privacy. You cannot have decentralized decision-making without privacy. And so I, think, I tend to think in terms of analog equivalent privacy rights. When I'm looking at what's happening in the digital world of our children, I'm, I'm looking back to, okay, how did this work for our parents in the technology they were using? Because there should be this kind of technology-neutral shift with maintained privacy. So I tend to look at the analog letter. This is my pr favorite example, the analog letter. When our parents did correspondence, they used an analog letter. This analog letter had certain characteristics to it. First of all, it was anonymous. Our parents decided whether to identify themselves on the inside of the letter for only the recipient to know on the outside of the envelope for the postal service to know, or frankly, none at, uh, none at all, not at all. This was their prerogative. And there is absolutely no reason our children should not have the same prerogative in their digital world. The analog letter was never opened in transit to see if it contained a crime. 
if a letter would be opened, then you needed to be under prior and individual suspicion of a serious and already committed crime for a, co for a judge to issue a warrant to open your mail from that point forward. No letter was ever opened to see if it contained a copied drawing. It was untracked in transit. Nobody got to see who communicated with whom. Partly because there was no technical ability to do it. That didn't stop a lot of societies from doing it anyway. We happened to be standing in old East Berlin. The wall has now been down for just a few weeks longer than it was up. But people remember, and those who don't should. Last but not least, the mailman was never, ever responsible for the carried message. This is a tradition that dates back to the Roman Empire, the messenger immunity, the courier immunity. These are four characteristics of the analog letter. It was never opened. The mail, ma the mail carrier was never responsible. It was untracked, and it was anonymous. Our children have lost all of this. Our children have lost all of this in their digital environment. And I'm arguing that it is absolutely reasonable that our children have the same at least the same level of digit rights in their digital environment as our parents had in their analog environment. And, when I'm, and I came into this from a copyright debate angle. So when I'm arguing this to the copyright industry, they go all ballistic. They go up into the stratosphere and say, you can't seriously say that you might anybody should be able to send anything to anybody anonymously. If you, can, if, you, if you allow this, we cannot make money. We cannot make a profit. So fucking what? Like, I, I seriously say that. Why is this even an argument? Why is it an argument that if we sustain civil liberties, you don't know how to run a business? So the entire world must adapt to you. And when you phrase it like that, the copyright industry doesn't have a case. It doesn't matter if they don't make money. It is completely beside the point. The point is that our children deserve the same rights as our parents had. It's really that simple. That's how I got into privacy. That's how I founded the Pir why I founded the Pirate Party. That's why I started rallying people together. And how do, so how do you inspire a movement? How do you get all of these people who say that you don't get to tell me what to do? How do you get all of these people to work together? It turns out is as simple and as complicated to just let people do whatever they want. You, the old organizations, may, when they needed 4,000 work hours a week, just to pull a number out of thin air, let's say 4,000 4, work hours a week in order to administer an organization, they needed 100 employees. That's expensive. That's a big running budget already. Today, we can do the same thing with 2,000 volunteers that contribute two hours per week. And they contribute those two hours per week simply because they get a better effect doing those two hours through our organization than doing it on their own. So they choose to work what do what they would have done anyway under a particular banner. And by doing so, the organization wins and they win. It it's a it's it comes together beautifully. And of course you don't have to pay anybody. 
which helps when you don't have a budget. So how do you do this? It's about leadership. It's about standing up. It's about going up on stage, going up on your soapbox, saying, hey, I'm going to do this. Who's with me? When I started the, fi the fire party, I didn't, t I didn't launch big advertising campaigns. All I did was go into a chat channel of a sh file sharing hub at the time and write two lines. Hey, look, the Pirate Party has its n website up now and the, the address. That was all the advertising I ever did. The next day, there were hundreds of volunteers l figuratively holding out their hands to me saying, give me something to do, I want to be a part of this. And it just grew from there. But this goal, this goal that you post, it needs certain characteristics to go ballistic. It needs to be big. It needs to be, it needs to inspire people. You can't, you can't build a volunteer organization like around something like, I'm going to create Germany's third best tax return software. So there are four characteristics that need to be fulfilled. Your goal needs to be tangible, credible, inclusive, and epic. It needs to be tangible. We're going to do exactly this. When this has happened, we have reached our goal. We are going to put people in parliament. While there's plenty of movements that say like, yeah, you know, we're all going to like, Feel good, man. Feeling good is a nice thing, but it's not a tangible goal. It needs to be credible. When you're posting this, you need to show people how you're going to get from today to where you want to be. And this can be done in many, many small steps, but each of them need to be credible. And together, anybody seeing this needs to see that each step, when chained together, goes from A to B. It needs to be inclusive. People who see this need to immediately identify, yes, I want to be a part of this. And there's my spot. That's what I want to do. And then just jump right into it without asking permission, without asking anybody's permission. And last but not least, it needs to be epic. Shoot for the moon. Actually, don't shoot for the moon. We've already been there. Shoot for Mars. Somebody else is already doing that too. Shoot for Titan. Don't make Germany's third best tax software. Shoot for the moon. And when you do this, people start rallying around this flag. And this is when you start, this is when you need to enable them to self-organize. Because when you have a hundred people talking to you saying, give me something to do, there's absolutely no way you can talk to e each and every one of them. The just the mere math breaks it down. Because if you're, if they, all want to spend one hour with you and you have 24 hours a day and there's hundreds of people, it just breaks down. So you need to be, you need to scale out. You need to scale out. And this is how you organize what I call a swarm organization. You optimize a swarm organization for three factors. Three factors. Those three factors are speed, trust, and scalability. Speed, trust, and scalability. You optimize for speed by cutting yourself entirely out of the loop. You are not the arbiter of de final decisions. Because the best actionable information is where people are making the decisions. You need to give them the confidence to make the decisions where they stand. Instead of asking somebody else to take responsibility for what they are doing. In the Pirate Party, we had something, we had something called a three-person rule. It meant that if three people were in agreement that something was good for the movement, then they had an automatic green light to act, not just act in the movement's name, but also spend the movement's resources toward that goal. This is an insane level of empowerment. This is an insane level of pushing authority to the edges. 
you're going to hear no, uh, no end of people saying that this will be abused horribly. You know what? The Pirate Party had 50,000 members peaking at 50,000. We had this rule for five years while I was a party member, and they continued it after I stepped down as well. But during the five years I was a party member wi uh, with 50,000 people, this was not abused once. Not once. It turns out that when you look people in the eye and say that, yeah, we both know that we share the same goals. I trust you. And you give them the keys to the castle. They step up to the plate. They step up to the plate. It helps, of course, that everything is transparent. As long as everybody else can see wha how everybody else is spending money, there's also a bit of peer pressure to perform. And so you're not getting away with squandering resources either. But so speed is of the essence. And by cutting yourself out of the loop and communicating that we are going to make mistakes here and it's okay. We might need 10 iterations of this in order to get it right. The faster we make those 10 iterations, the faster we get it right. And so it's okay to make mistakes because nobody has done this before us. Nobody has gone to Mars. Nobody has gone to Titan. We need to find the way. Therefore, by definition, we're going to make mistakes. Back up, know that that was a dead end, and find somewhere else. This is also something that you need to sort of drill into people, that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to spend money and resources on things that turned out to be not the, right, not the correct way. Because everybody knows that everybody is fighting for the same cause, which helps people trust each other. And <laughs> in an example of this, when you're looking at really big organizations, they tend to make the most outrageous mistakes even though they have millions in a budget. And when you realize that no amount of checks and balances are going to save you from the silliest mistakes, then you can get this zen attitude that, yeah, maybe 30% of our resources or initiatives are going to be duds, that's okay. Once you get this th that's okay feeling, people get comfortable with taking risks. And so at that point you start making mer massive parallel processing of finding the right avenues. In terms of big organization making mistakes, I sometimes take the Swedish hospital landlord, Locum. Their logo is pretty straightforward. I this would be one of my slides, but I if you can see before your eyes just locum written out in lowercase, L-O-C-U-M, simple, hel simple Helvetica, L-O-C-U-M with a bit of spacing between uh, behind it, between it. They had a pretty bad reputation in Sweden. They were known as greedy, har hard, harsh negotiators and so on. And so they decided to make a Christmas campaign to turn it around the attitude of their company. And to portray themselves as a warm and friendly company, they replaced the O in their logo with a big red heart and plastered their salt all over Swedish media. So there, so there was a lowercase L, a big red heart, and C-U-M. Uh, and I'm not making that up. You can still find it if you search for advertising locum. It's legendary. And I mean, if you can make that kind of mistake when you have a multi-million budget, you, can s you sort of realize that no amount of checks and balances are going to stop you from making mistakes. And if no amount, if there's not any amount that's going to stop you from making mistakes, then just go with it. It's going to happen. Go Zen. That's speed. Trust. There's going to be... So many different ways of interpreting your vision into th and toward the end goal. Tens of thousands of people are going to do something small every day that they think push in generally the right direction. Some people 
are going to look at people over there and say that I have no idea what these people are doing. I think it's counterproductive. That's okay. Because we know that we're all sharing the same end vision. And I don't understand the context of the people over there. And they don't necessarily understand the context I'm in. So as long as I know that the people over there are sharing my goals, then I don't need to understand exactly why they're doing what they're doing. As long as you communicate this trust al among the entire movement, then you're creating this sense of everybody can do what they want and it's okay. We don't vote. We don't use coerc coercive methods. We don't say you must. We don't say you must not. We say that, hey, here's the end goal. Try to work toward it. And magic happens. The, end, the last of the three is scalability. You're creating a scaffolding of go-to people that you'll see people gradually step up to the plate and take more and more responsibility. When they do, you're asking them politely like, hey, I'm s I see that people are sort of coming to you for, for this and that purpose. Do you mind if we make this, this official and write it somewhere so that you so that newcomers know where to go? And in this way, you're creating a scaffolding of maybe 5% of the activists total. This scaffolding enables everybody else to come and go at their leisure, which is what creates this swarm organization, and which makes it in immensely powerful. It scales beautifully. It scales to tens of thousands of people with no bottlenecks. And after this, after communicating the goal, which is tangible, inclusive, credible, and epic, and organizing the swarm to be optimized for speed, trust, and scalability, there's one more thing. There's one more thing which you cannot be without. And that is having fun. I know, this is, I know this is so stereotypical. I mean, we've all heard Silicon Valley types talking about having fun on the job, which for them means buying a pinball game and putting it in the basement somewhere. This is not what f having fun means. Remember, inspiring a movement means attracting volunteers. And this means you need to understand people's motivations a little bit. People are, people, it turns out, seek out other people who are having fun and go there because they want to also have fun. The reverse is also true. If you're not having fun, people will detect that from a distance and take a long mile around you. So it turns out that having fun is more about is not more it's not so much about playing pinball at work. When you're dealing with this kind of movement, it's actually a requirement for success to enjoy what you're doing. And, and I don't see that as a bad thing, really. As in, I'm sorry, I have to have fun on the job. I can't. I can't. No, I can't do this. It's boring. I need to. I need to have fun. Sorry. Bye. And it's, and it's not just completely okay, but actually required. And when you do this, you'll find that a swarm intelligence emerges. The entire crowd of people becomes an emergent system that comes together to solve the goal you initially stated when you set the flag in the ground and said, hey, I'm going to do this. Does anybody want to join me? And so, we did put people in Parliament on less than 1% of the competition's budget. This works. It's been proven to work again and again and again by the simple recipe 
of allowing people to participate in what they want, how they want it, instead of using this old formal structures of voting and coercion and telling people what to do. If you want to read more about this, there's a book called Swarm Wise. Nine, nine letters, Swarm Wise. You can download it as a PDF for free off my website. Just search for Swarm Wise nine letters. You'll find it immediately. There's beta software that enables organizations to set up structures like this called Swarm Ops. I don't have a lot of imagination, but it at least the name sticks. And that's how I did when I inspired a movement. And that's how other people have copied my recipe and inspired movements in turn. It works. Thanks. Do we want to do a Q&A or do we, do we want to push, push ahead? We are a little bit behind schedule, so let's take two, two questions and I'll be available here. Sure. Do I think this works for organizations that tend to be attacked or infiltrated, or just or do I think it works for open groups? I think it particularly works for organizations that tend to be attacked or infiltrated, because when, s when the traditional world is attacking an organization, they will look for an organization they understand. They will seek out a procedure to hijack and get a pivotal vote to change the structure of the entire organization. When you have an organization that basically says anybody can do what they want, and we don't even really know who's part of the organization and who's not, it just slips through their fingers. There's nothing to grab onto. You can do something, but it'll just get ignored. The leadership here is that any in a traditional organization, you get influence by submitting a, p a motion to a meeting and then campaigning to have that voted on. In a swarm, you obtain influence by standing up and saying, I'm going to do this. Anybody who wants to is free to follow. And if you don't want to, that's okay too. The traditional world doesn't know how to infiltrate that. Uh, do I have a set of formalized rules for this kind of governance? There are some formalized rules, like the three-person rule I talked about. If three people are in agreement that something is good for the movement, then they have a green light from the, t from, uh, the top of the... Well, to, to go ahead and do something. It takes a little while to explain what this means to people, because s or it people can't really... We're so indoctrinated in thinking of power as power that we can't sep easily separate power to empower ourselves was versus power to disempower others. So it took quite some explaining to say that, no, you can only empower yourself. You don't, you don't get to have three people to say what other people cannot do. You can only use this three-person rule to say that what you can do, not what others must or cannot do. And explaining that these are actually two different concepts I is new to a lot of people. But yeah, in my book Swarmwise, I'm going through a lot of the practical experiences with more, more details about how you can tickle people's reward mechanisms. Okay, one more. Does this work when profit is involved? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is actually a hybrid of three different leadership types. Military, dot com, and, and uh, volunteer. And I used to work as a middle manager in the dot com boom era. In that time, if people didn't like what you said at the morning meeting, they would walk out there and then and have a better paying job before lunch. When people are working for m money isn't necessarily the biggest motivator we have. My favorite example there is 
a Mexican game studio called Squad. Who here plays Kerbal Space Program? A couple. So Kerbal Space Program is a, is a game made in Mexico. It has a huge community of modders making more content for this space program in a box kind of simulator. So, and several of these modders were working practically full time to just create new awesome stuff that people could pull into space. They were so awesome that the studio squad offered to hire them full time. But they did so using Mexican wages where they would be paid $200 a month for working full time with somebody to report to in a horrible corporate structure. At which point most of them said, hell no, I'm out of here and didn't create anything more evermore. So money can be a demotivator and in my experience the social mechanisms you build using this movement, almost tribal, they are so much more fundamental to the human psyche that they far trump any for-profit or not-for-profit aspect of it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute. I'll be around if you have more questions.